So this will be part two of the exam take up for the MHF4U final exam. Now remember that exams are particular to teachers as well. So don't think if you can do mine that you've got it nailed. It's just that you should be going over your practice tests and see what your teacher focuses on. And usually teachers will give you some idea of, of what they want you to focus on for the exam as well. Okay, so this is part B. It's uh, 58 marks. You should always check the marking scheme if you have one and make sure that you're doing enough work for two marks, for instance. So it says, without dividing, determine the remainder of this divided by x plus 4. So you should remember that there's something you learn called the remainder theorem. And the remainder theorem says that if you, um, if f at k is equal to x, then x is the remainder. You might have used different letters somewhere along the way, but basically that's what it's saying. So if I know that um, f at minus 4 will give me the remainder. So all you have to do is plug in f at minus 4 here. So I have minus 2 times minus 4 squared. And minus 7 times minus 4 plus 1. So that's just evaluating that. So that gives you 16 times minus 2 is minus 32 plus 28 plus 1. So that's 29 minus 32 would be minus 3. And that's all you have to do. And that, that's about two marks worth, isn't it? Determine if x plus 3 is a factor. Now remember that if something is a factor, if x plus 3 is a factor, then you should know x at minus 3, or f at minus 3, is going to be equal to 0. So f at minus 3 equals 0 would be a factor. I don't have to write that out. So I'm going to plug in f at minus 3. And I'll remember that's all you're doing is plugging in minus 3 everywhere you see an x. So I'm going to write minus 3 here. Just so we have a nice equation. And minus 3 to the power of 4, that's um, 81 times 2 is 162. This is negative 27 times 5 would be minus 135. This is 9 times minus 2 is minus 18 minus 9. So does this add up to 162? That's 27, 35, and 27 is 62. So I have 162 minus 162 equals 0. Therefore, x plus 3 is a factor. Nice and easy. And you'd be happy. Okay, so remember if you don't have this exam that you can find it on the link. Download it, give it a try. Okay, this question says divide this by this and write your answer in the form of a division statement. So, um... Synthetic division would be, it's more challenging to do it that way than to, to do long division, unless the coefficient of x here is, is uh, 1. So I'm going to use long division, and that means I need to make a nice dividing here. Now remember when you're doing these division questions to make sure that you have a place for each of the variables in descending order. In other words, if I didn't have any x squareds, I'd have to write in a 0x squared, but not here. I have one. I have one for every one. Nice question. Okay, so now I divide, and I divide by trying to get rid of this first. So I want something multiplies by 2x to give me 4x cubed, and that would be 2x squared. Okay, so when you multiply the number, this you're getting rid of these one at a time. So that gives me 4x cubed and minus 2x squared. Now the biggest mistake that people make with these is that you are subtracting. So when you have a negative, like 4 minus 2, it's 4 minus minus 2, so that gives me 6x squared, and these ones cancel out. I bring down the next term. I want to get rid of 6x squared, so that means I need to multiply by 3x. So it gives me 6x squared minus 3x, and again, remember you're subtracting. That's gone. Minus, minus, and minus means I'm adding 3, so that gives me minus 10x. I bring down the 7, 
and the last is going to be a minus 5 here. Remember, you're trying to get rid of minus 10x, so that gives me minus 10x plus 5, and I subtract and I get 2. So that's the division part. So I've divided it, but you want the answer as a division statement. So for the division statement, I'm going to write that 4x cubed plus 4x squared minus 13x plus 7 divided by 2x minus 1 equals, and I write this times this, because remember, um, I'll write this out and then I'm going to show you just a little thing that you may have forgotten. So I do that times 2x minus 1 plus 2. That's my division statement. Same thing if I divided 3 into, let's say, 13, and I would have said uh, 12, 1. So 13 would be equal to 4 times 3 plus 1. Okay, so if you forget what the division statement is, make yourself a little thing that doesn't divide evenly so that you have to say, um, you know, add the 1. Okay, number four, sketch the graph of the piecewise function below and determine where the function is discontinuous. So when you have a graph on yours, I had to make one here for you. So you want to check all these points where everything joins together, right? So the first little graph is going to be a linear function if x is less than minus one. So you want to know where the function is when x is equal to negative 1, and you're just going to put an open circle there. So I put in negative 1, negative 1 plus 3, negative 1 plus 3 is 2, so negative 1 and 2, and I put an open circle because I'm not including that point, right? That's my, that's my joining point here. And it has a slope of 1, um, and it's going to go through minus 3, right? So it'll be a line like this. Okay, so there's the first part, done. Hey, check. Now I have a quadratic, x squared plus 1. If x is, well, you can read that. So if I put a negative 1 here, f at negative 1, this was the first one, right? f at negative 1. So if I do f at negative 1 for the second function here, I would have 1 plus 1 is also 2. So because this is covering the negative 1 equal part, that means this part is going to be, I'm going to do it in a different color so you see what I'm talking about. So this includes this point now. It kind of looked black anyway, didn't it? Okay, so I have that point. Now it's a quadratic that's been shifted up one. So that means the vertex will be here. And I want to know what will the height of the function be when x is equal to 2. So if I put in 2 here, 2 squared plus 1, that's 5. So I have, when x is 2, I'm at 3, 4, 5. And it's equal to there. So I put a solid circle, and I draw my parabola up like that. Oh, it should have joined a little better. Okay, now the last part. Ooh, the log. Oh, you're going to be really sad. How do I draw a logarithmic function? Okay, so you have to use um, the exponential first, remember? So this is a base of 2. So I want to know what points make 2 to the x, 2 to the x, right? What's 2 to the x? What are the coordinates of 2 to the x? If I go from, so I want x greater than 2, so I'm just going to plug in 2, 3, 4. That should be enough. Okay, so I'm going to put x here, so 2, 3, 4. So 2 squared is 4, 2 cubed is 8, and 2 to the 4th is 16. So these are the points for the exponential. Now, do you remember how to find a logarithmic function? It's the inverse, right? I just have to switch it. So that means that the log base 2 of x, not the transposed one, would be, um, I'm just going to write that out here. So we'll have 4, 2. We'll have 8, 3. And we'll have 16 and 4. Right? So those would be the points on the logarithmic function, log base 2x. So remember, you just find the 2 to the x first, switch the coordinates, and that gives me some points for log base 2x. So now I want to know what happens if I shift it 2 to the left, right? So 2 to the left means I'm just subtracting 2 from 
this x coordinate. So the log base 2 of x plus 2, to shift it to the left 2, so it's going to be 2, 2, that's going to be 6, 3, and that's going to be 14 and 2. So lucky for me, it covered where x is 2, right? So I have 2, 2. So 1, 2, 1, 2, that's going to be here, and it's greater than, oops, so I'm going to put an open circle here. And I have another point, I have 6 and 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 3, and 14 and 2. So it's going to go out like this. I should have gone through that dot. Let's just make it bigger, much bigger. Okay, so this is my log graph, and the don't forget to read the question carefully, right? Sketch the graph and determine where the function is discontinuous. So... It's continuous here, so you don't have to lift my pencil, but when I get here, boom, got to jump down here before I start driving, driving, drawing it again. You can pretend you're in a car if you want. So therefore, the function is discontinuous at, discontinuous, trying to write fast, at this point here, two. I probably should say when x is equal to two we have this great divide here. That's a jump discontinuity. Okay, so that was a little bit challenging. Now uh, let's see what we've got here. This paper is folded and it's making a shadow. I'm sorry. The parent function f at x equals 2 to the x is transformed into the function defined by this. So this is giving you a rule. Remember that from grade 11? Write the defining equation of y equals this. So I want this to be the parent, and I want this to be the, um, the function that I'm going to, the, the transformation that I want to apply here. So that means that y is going to be minus 3. The function is 2 to the x. So I'm going to write, I'm going to put it in brackets. 2 to the x, so that's 2x plus 4 plus 1. And there you go. That's all you had to do. Um, write the mapping rule. Now remember, this is uh, something a teacher might be trying to trick you on. So I would write that out again. y equals minus 3 times 2 to the 2 bracket x plus 2, close the bracket, plus 1. So now you can see the transformations and you can state the mapping rule much easier. Okay, so x, y go to, what do I do to my x's? Well, I divide by 2 and I subtract 2. So x divided by 2, subtract 2. And my y is going to be minus 3y plus 1. If 3, 8 is a point on the parent function, what is the corresponding point? I, it's image on the graph of the transformed function. So all I have to do is plug in 3 here for x, 3 over 2, that's 3 halves minus 4 halves, that would be minus a half. And when y is 8, that would be minus 24 plus 1 is minus 23. Okay, so there's your, your transformed point. Determine the domain and range of the transformed function. Okay, so it's an exponential function. And as you know, exponential functions, I can put in any value for x here and get an answer for y, right? No problem. So that means the domain d equals x. x is an element of real numbers. And what is the range now? Now the range is going to be a little trickier because I'm going to make a little sketch of it over here for you. Um, we have an asymptote, you see it's been lift, shifted up one, so normally the asymptote would be here. So now the asymptote's going to be here, so this would be y equals 1. And the function has been, see how we're reflecting the y values. So the y was here, it's now down here. So you know that the exponential function would go this way. So now I've flipped it, that gets the negative, and I've shifted it up. So when x is 0, what would y be equal to? Let's plug that in just to find out. Uh, when x is 0, I would have 2 to the 4th is 16. That's minus 
48 plus 1. Ooh, it's way down there, right? It's down very far. So we didn't reflect about the y-axis, just about the, uh, the x-axis, right? So this negative, negative y. So remember, negative y means it's going to go down that way. So we have the graph is going to be going this way. So that, that means that the, I don't, don't exactly have the exact point here. We had zero and negative something. It's way down here. Um, probably looks more like about like this, like not crossing this line. So the range is going to be, range is y such that y is less than 1 and y is an element of real numbers. Okay, so that's number 5. Let's turn the page here and see what we have here. Okay, so it says a position of an object that is moving along a straight line, <coughs> excuse me, at t seconds is given by this in meters. Determine the average velocity between t equals 1 and t equals 3. Well, you know how to find average velocity. <coughs> What's t at 1? S at 1, I mean. When t is 1, I have 6 over 3. Just putting in 1 here. 6 divided by 3 is 2. And at 3 seconds, what's S at 3? So I have 18 divided by 5. So I have 18 over 5. So that gives me two coordinates, right? And now all I have to do to determine the average velocity is find the slope between those two points. In other words, the slope of a secant. So I have 18 over 5 minus 2 divided by 3 minus 1. And I'm going to let you do all that math on your own, and I'm going to tell you the answer comes out to four-fifths meters per second. Okay, what's the instantaneous velocity at three? You may approximate, so that's nice. So I'm going to use S at three, which I already have, is 18 over five, and I'm going to choose S at 3.01. Okay, so if I put in S at 3.01, I have to find out what is, what happens when this is 3.01. So you're going to just use your little calculator here, and you're going to put in 6 times 3.01. I can't even see this here. I have to get it into the light. So let's try that again. So we had 3.01 times 6. I know you can't see this on the screen, but it's a really strange lighting day today. So that's going to be 18.06 divided by uh, 5.01. And I'm going to find the slope between those two points. So instantaneous velocity is equal to, and I would just leave all these decimals in here, all that you can, so that minus 18 over 15, which is, sorry, 18 over 5, and I'm going to divide by 0 0.01, which is this one minus this one. And that comes out to about 0 0.48 meters per second. Okay, moving on to some solving questions. We have... Solve for x. x is an element of real numbers. And we have an absolute value function, and I want to know where is that less than 5. So as you know, with an absolute value, you can have two possible solutions in here. Let's say I want to know when is this equal to 5. So it could be the negative of this. So I could put in negative 8 plus 3 is negative 5. Absolute value of negative 5 is 5 or 2, right? So I know, um, I know where that's happening. You can also think of it this way. Watch this, this might be even easier. What is the absolute value function? Well, it goes like this, right? So it has the slope of one, so it's one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four. So when x was five, this was also five, and minus five, this would have been five. But it's been shifted to the left three. So if I move this over three, one, two, three, I'm now going to be at 2. 
when this is at 5. So it's going to go like this. And I move this over 3. And it's going to go like this. Right? So you can do it visually as well. So I know now that it's going to be um, between minus 8. So this would be minus 8 here because I moved it 3 to the left of minus 5. And I moved it 3 to the left. So this was minus 3 and minus 3 gives me these two numbers. I want it less than, so you could do it this way as well. I'll show you, like, depends on, it's only worth two marks. I would say if you got a little graph, did a sketch and said what the answer is. Um, so I know it's going to be minus eight is less than X is less than two. That's going to be the solution because I've moved it three to the left of those. Or you could do it like this. I can say X plus three is equal to five or x plus 3 is equal to negative 5. So that's covering the two possible absolute value solutions here. So this would give you x equals 2. This would give you x equals negative 8. And then you know from a number line that you're between here and here, right? So which is what I've drawn for you here. So you get the same answer as this. Okay took up some of my space here. This one's worth three marks. It is um, solving this inequality here and we have a rational expression. So remember that you can't just cross multiply these or you will miss out on some very important information. So you should bring this to the other side and I want to know where is that greater than or equal to zero. So if I find a common denominator now, I would have x times x plus 1. And in the top, I would multiply this by x plus 1. So that gives me 2x plus 2 minus an x. And that gives me x plus 2. So I have x plus 2 over x times x plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so... You know where it will be equal to zero when x is negative two, but you might want to do a quick little sketch of this function just so that you know what you're dealing with. Okay, so I have an x-intercept. That's from here, minus two. It's going to cross here. I have two asymptotes. Let me get a red pen here. Hopefully it works. So I have one at zero, and I have one at minus one. So my, my graph is going to be really strange here. And you know that these are, do you remember, these are called odd asymptotes. So I have a number of zones here. I have what happens when x is less than 1. So I'm going to say minus infinity, oh, minus infinity to 2, sorry. This point here, these are all critical points. This is x equals minus 1, x equals 0. So between negative infinity and 2, am I going to be under or over the x-axis? Because that makes it positive or negative, right? Um, I have another zone that would be between 2 and minus 1. These are intervals I'm looking at. So between 2 and minus 1, between minus 1 and 0, and then 0 to infinity. Okay, so I want to pick some points. Let's make this a little shorter so I don't use up my space for the next question. So when I'm between negative infinity and negative 2, I'm sorry about that, that should be negative 2, um, and negative 2, I heard you yelling. I heard you yelling over the internet saying, it's how bad, it's negative 2. Okay, so if I'm less than negative 2, what I want to know is, is this going to be positive or negative? That's all you care about. So don't have to do the math, just little baby calculations here. So let's say I pick negative 3. So minus 3 plus 2, that's negative. This is negative, and this is negative. So I have three negatives, so that's negative. Between minus 2 and minus 1, I'm going to have to use like minus 1 and a half. So that would make this positive, this negative, this negative. So positive, negative, negative, positive. And minus 1 to 0. So I use minus a half. 
that's positive, that's negative, that's positive. So I'm back to negative. And any number bigger than zero, if I put in two, that would be positive, 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 all positives. There we go. So I do know that this function is coming up this way. It was positive between here and here. Now, this is an odd asymptote. That means the other part of the graph is going to be in here somewhere, right? And because this one's going down and they're odd asymptotes, this one has to be going up and there are no other x-intercepts. So this has to be going like that. And there you go. Um, you should also know that where I want to know where it is greater than or equal to zero. So my answer is going to be um, minus two, now square bracket, right? Because it's including this point. So we'll do interval notation first. So minus two to minus one, not including minus one because that's an asymptote. Union, and I have um, this point here, which is zero to infinity. So X is an element of, and that would be a very nice solution. Okay, so the last question on this page, it says, what is the log three, base three, x minus five plus log base three, x minus seven equals one, solve it. Okay, so your logarithmic rules say if I'm adding two logs together, I can multiply these. So I can make it into one log. Sometimes it might say express as a single log and you would do that. So I'm going to expand this, so I have x squared Minus 7x minus 5x is minus 12x plus 35 is equal to 1. Okay, now you're stuck, right? What do you do when you're stuck and you're in logs? You go to exponential form. So 3 to the power of 1, 3 to the power of 1 equals x squared minus 12x plus 35. I bring the 3 over here and set it to 0 plus 32 equals 0. Well, multiplies to 32 and adds to negative 12. You should say x minus 4 times x minus 8 equals 0. So that gives me two solutions. x is equal to, well, yeah, x is equal to 4 and x is equal to 8. Now I have to check to see if these are in admissible or inadmissible solutions. So if I put in a 4 here, I would have 4 minus 5 as a negative number. We can't find logs of negative numbers. So this one is inadmissible. Inadmissible. And you might want to write negative log. And what if I put in 8? 8 minus 5, that's positive, and 8 minus 7 is positive. So the only solution is x equals 8. Okay, how are we doing for time here? Getting tired? Okay, I think I will do, I'll just do one more question. We're up to 28 minutes already. So if the function f times, f equals f times g and f at x is this and g at x is this, what is the domain of f? So remember when you're multiplying, adding or subtracting functions, you have to have overlapping domains. So what is the domain of f at x? Domain of f at x equals, so if I put in a 4 here, I would get 0. If I put in a 5, it would be a negative number. So that's the wrong way, right? So I would get x. x is less than or equal to 4. x is an element of real numbers. So if I put in 4, if I put in 3, 2, 1, negative numbers, I could find the square root. Okay, so what's the domain of g at x? Well, it's x again. And I can't take the log of a negative number, so it has to be, and it can't be 0, so it has to be greater than 3. x is greater than 3. Okay, so where do these two overlap? So I would have 4 here, including that one. And I have 3, it has to be bigger than that one, so my only domain is between 3 and 4. So I could write it this way, minus 3 
less than x, less than or equal to 4. Okay, I think I'll stop there and I'll do the rest in another section and hope this is going well for you.